Hello, it's Duncan. I know, I said there would only be one Fizzbuzz episode, but then people kept on making comments on that episode and asking me questions, and HTTP benchmarking is still hard, and I just can't help myself. I like to play with code and talk about it. So today we'll go back to a blank Fizzbuzz slate and use the exercise to look at a really important topic, actions and calculations, or impure and pure functions. We'll get things working as quickly and dirtily as we can, and then look at the code to help understand the difference between the different function types why we should prefer calculations, why actions come to dominate code unless we take action, and how to use Kotlin sequences to keep our code both pure and responsive. And oh my goodness, does this have a lot of state in it. Code carters are there to be practiced in much the same way, I guess, as martial arts carters. I might practice a carter focusing on coordination of mind and body or on power or fluidity. The carter is the same, but my focus might be different. So this time, instead of using FizzBuzz to learn about TDD, we're going to use it to think about actions and calculations. So I've rolled back to the point where we just had the acceptance tests and we have no implementation at all. So I guess this is going to fail. And does, uh, splendid. I had a little chat with Dave A about whether these acceptance tests were actually complete. And his point was, well, we're only testing the first lines, these ones here. Now, I'm not convinced that it's the nature of acceptance tests that they have to test everything. After all, that would mean that we had to test every possible first name and every possible second name of all our customers. I think the nature of acceptance tests is that we agree the feature is done when they pass. Now, I suppose I could write code that returned banana for line 21, or every third Tuesday when there was full moon, and the test wouldn't capture that problem. But mostly acceptance tests aren't trying to protect us against any action. They're there to help us agree with our product owner when our software is done. But this emphatically isn't done, so let's crack on. I'm going to try a slightly different approach this time. We've got this capturing stood out, which if you remember did this system set out, which is a bit unsafe if we're running lots of tests. If we're prepared to accept a little tiny bit of risk, we can structure this differently. So what we can do here is we can say that our main is going to call fizzbuzz, passing it a print stream. So the thing it's going to output to. In our main, we'll pass it system out. Now, if we create that function, we've got an out, and we can create it on the print stream and import. Now we can test not our main, but our fizzbuzz past a different print stream. So we've made a little seam in our software here to allow us to test it without this capturing stood out. So what would that look like? Well, I guess we take something like this. So we'd have a byte array output stream to capture the bytes. We go back in here and we'd say, that's our output. Now we can call fizzbuzz on a print stream on our output. And now our lines is our output two string lines. And that allows us to get rid of this bit. And we now don't need that. And now we don't have test coverage of main, but main only calls one thing and we test that one thing. So the test should fail in the same way. Well, okay, not in exactly the same way because of this to do. So let's go ahead and fix that. And I'm gonna fake it till I make it again. I'm going to say, Let's just copy this thing into here. This thing will say out dot print line with our first lines, and we won't be able to pass the test that there are 101 lines. So I'm just going to comment that out and see that it passes. Phew. Right then, as I said, the goal here is not to show test room development. So let's just get this passing as quickly as we can. So fizz bars on an output stream, I think will be for i in 1 to 100. Yes, good. And every time through this loop, we're going to say println not first lines, but when i mod 15 is 0, fizzbuzz. Well, ai autocomplete was pretty good there. i mod 3 equals 0, buzz. Hmm, I'm pretty sure that should be fizz. So 1 all for an autocomplete. And then i mod 5, buzz. Oh, well, it's learned at least. And then else i dot two string. Does that pass? Splendid. And if we're right now, we should be able to reinstate these two three lines. Thunderbar. And now our fake it till we make it first lines can go. So now what's an action and what's a calculation? I'll put a link in the show notes to a chapter from my book that you can read for free. But in short, an action is any function that it matters when or whether we run it. 
And I suppose because any expression we could extract into a function, it's actually any code that matters when or whether we run it. So looking at our fizzbuzz here, does it matter when we run it? Well, yes, it does, because when we run it, it will print to the standard output. Does it matter whether we run it? Well, yes, because if we don't run it, it won't print to this print string. So fizzbuzz is an action, as is main. Look at our tests. That means that this line here, where we invoke fizzbuzz, is itself an action. OK, I talked about actions and calculations. So what's a calculation? Well, a calculation is code that isn't an action. So for example, this code here, output to string. If output to string always returns the same string for a given value of this variable, then output to string is a calculation. It doesn't matter when we run it. And same is true of lines. If splitting up a string into lines for a given string always returns the same result, then it's a calculation. Now, fizzbuzz is an action. We've established that. But the actual action -y bit here is this printman. There's also this bit inside here that is a calculation, which is to say for a given value of i, it will always return the same value of fizzbuzz, fizzbuzz, or i2string. So this code doesn't matter when we call it. It just matters what we call it with. And we can see that if we extract a function out of this. So this is going to be to this buzz. And you can see that this doesn't print anything. And it doesn't depend on the time. And it doesn't depend on random numbers. So any time we call this with a given i, we'll always get the same result. And functional programmers call that a pure function. They have another special word, which is referentially transparent, which means that whenever we see fizzbuzz of 7, we can always replace it with 7 as a string. So we can replace a function invocation by the result of calling it. And note that purity doesn't depend on how we get our inputs. So if I make this the receiver, this now is still an input to this function. So int fizzbuzz is still a calculation or a pure function. So calculations or pure functions are very predictable. Our actions aren't as predictable because what happens depends on whether or when we call them. We like predictable software, so we want to make as much of our software into calculations as we can. Now, in our fizzbuzz, we have 100 actions we're performing because each time through the loop, we call this action. But if two fizzbuzz is a calculation, it doesn't matter when we call it. So we could pre-calculate everything we're going to print, and that would be a calculation. I'm going to do that in the simplest way I can imagine, which is to say I've got this val lines is a mutable list of string. And now my for loop, instead of doing the printing, is going to add i to fizzbuzz to the lines. And then we can take away the println. Now we can go through these lines and say lines for each out dot println it. How's that? Good. And so here we separated out a calculation of what we're going to output from the output. So this now, if I make a method out of it, we'll call it fizzbuzzLines. And fizzbuzzLines is a calculation. It doesn't depend on when we run it. It will always give the same results. It is a returning a mutable list. And if we work with mutable lists, then we have action problems. If people change them, then calling functions on them depends on when they call the function. So we should say this is not a mutable list, but a list. Now then. Fizzbuzz lines is a calculation, but inside it, we start with a mutable list of lines and we have this for loop and it is adding things to this mutable list of lines. So this line here is very much an action. Its effect depends on when we run it, what's already in lines. So we can call actions within calculations, but only if the action doesn't escape. Normally speaking, if we have a calculation and it goes and calls an action, it might depend on the time of day, for example, or print something, then it becomes an action itself. So actionless is kind of a taint. As soon as we allow it in, more and more of our software becomes actions. And because actions are harder to reason about, more and more of our software is hard to reason about. There's another little action hidden in here, which is that i is mutated. It changes. It goes from 1 and 2, 3, 4, and so on. So the effect of this line here is different every time. Functional programming, though, has found ways of hiding these things from us so that we don't have to write the actions. It'll be hidden inside things. And we can see that here. If we take this thing and make a variable out of it, that gives us an int range. Now we can take that thing and call map on it. And in the map, we will return it to fizzbuzz. And now that is the thing that we can just return. It's got the right type. That allows us to get rid of the mutable list and our for loop. 
Does that do the same thing? It does. Now there's still actions happening in here. There's still mutations. If we look inside map, you will see that's map two. And map two has this for items in this and a destination that it adds things to. So actions are going on, but they're hidden inside this nice map here. One of the nice things about calculations is that they read nicely with an expression body. So we can say that, and that basically says this fizzbuzz lines is defined to be create a range and map it fizzbuzz over it. And as a general rule, I reserve single expression functions for things that are calculations and not actions. I think my brain just goes equals, ah, that's a calculation. Okay, so int fizzbuzz is a calculation. Fizzbuzz lines is a calculation. Fizzbuzz is an action and main is an action. Let's look again at the actions inside fizzbuzz. One thing to say is that assignment is an action. It matters when it happens. So for example, we can't move this down here because we needed something in this lines variable before we could do a for each on it. So we need to undo that. And now the other action here is this out println. And remember I said there are a hundred of those happening, one for every line. Well, we could make more of fizzbuzz a calculation by pre-computing what we want to print. So we could say join to string with a separator. And then we could say, not lines for each println, but we could just say out.println. Now we don't have to loop over every one. We've got a calculation that is the entire output. It passes. And so we've moved as much really as we can here into a calculation because there's just one invocation of an action in Fizzbuzz. That one invocation of an action though can be seen from outside. So Fizzbuzz is still an action. Now, we might inline lines now, like that. I'm trying not to do that, because now we have a line that is both action and calculation. If I undo that, then in my mind I can separate out, this is a calculation what we're doing, and this is doing the thing. Now, before we go on, I'm just gonna pull this number here out as a parameter here, which is rounds and then pull it out of here as another parameter, which is again rounds. Now that will allow us to play more than 100 rounds. And as we did last time, we can see what happens if we try and play lots and lots of rounds. So we'll put max value in there. And if I run that, now we see one of the problems we have with values. We have to calculate all of Fizzbuzz lines, which means building a list of int max value elements and then join that to a string, it's going to be a very, very long string before we can do anything. So we've still got no output here. But that I suppose is a manifestation of the fact that it depends on when we do actions. Ideally, we'd like to see this output earlier, but we can't do that with this one big value here. Also, we discover we can't do anything because we don't have enough memory to calculate this lines up front. So what to do? Well, first of all, we want intermediate output. So joining to a string isn't going to work for us. We're going to need to return this to calculate all the lines and then for line in lines, out print and line. Now, if I run that, I still don't get intermediate output because we still have to build this entire list here. So let's stop that. And now I'm going to change the signature here from list of string to iterable. So that makes this lines iterable to string which is fine because four is perfectly happy to work on iterable. Now then, let's make this a block body and say, instead of creating a range here and mapping it, I'm going to return an object that implements iterable. So we'll forget about that for now. And we'll say object iterable of string. Okay. And iterable of string just has one function and that it gets an iterator. So we can do that. And here we're going to return another object, which is an iterator of string. And that, if we implement the members, has two members, has next and next, which we need to think about. So has next wants to say, I have another one until we've reached rounds. And so we need to keep a bit of state in here. We need to say that I have a variable, which I'm going to call i, just the round that we're in. And it's going to start with one because our rounds start with one. And we are going to have next if i is less than or equal to the number of rounds. And next wants to return a string, and that string is going to be the next of our fizzbuzzes, given this variable here. 
So we're going to return i to fizzbuzz. And once code has asked for the next one, we are going to increment our i. So I think that's a post increment. I think we should be able to say i plus plus to fizzbuzz. Should we try that? Well, there we go. So we hadn't had to pre-compute the entire list. We'll try running all the tests just to check that the logic is right. And it is good. A little bit of tidying up here. This is just an expression body. This is an expression body. This is an expression body. And this one can't be because of our little bit of state here. And I'll just drop that down there. OK, so now the question is, is fizzbuzz lines an action or a calculation? And the answer is somewhat strangely that it's a calculation. And it's a calculation because for every given number of rounds here, the object that it returns will be the same object. It doesn't matter when you call it, this iterable will be the same. Now, the object that the iterable is returning, this iterator, it has next and next are obviously actions because they depend on the value of i, which depends on how many times you've called next. But fizzbuzz lines itself is a calculation. So this iterable trick has allowed us to keep the calculation, but lazily evaluate to fizzbuzz so that we only call this every time we need it, and we haven't built a list of int max value elements. Now, last time we didn't have an iterable here, we had a sequence. And it's a dirty little secret that they are effectively the same interface. If we make this into sequence, a string, then we need to return a sequence of string here. But a sequence of string only has one function, and that function returns an iterator. And that now changes the type of this to be sequence of string. But as four works on sequences, that's fine. There we go. And now we're talking in terms of sequences, Kotlin has ways of building them for us. Remember that our sequence here is really just hiding an action going on. But we can call generate sequence, giving it an initial value, and what to do to generate the next value. So that's going to be it plus one. Now that's going to be the equivalent of these i's, but we still need to do the fizzbuzz. So we still need to say map it to fizzbuzz. So that generate sequence takes the place of all of this. But generate sequence doesn't know when to stop. In other words, our rounds is not used now, but we can put that back in by saying take rounds. And take produces another sequence that counts up until it has yielded this number of rounds. So if I run that, we are good. And if we run main, we get our intermediate output. And note that if we just move this take here out of here and into where we want to do it, which is here, then we wouldn't need to have this rounds. We could root that. That would still pass the tests. And now if we reinstate our manual sequence, one moment, please. So we want this version pretty much. Uh, missed. Oh, this wants to be sequence. This wants to be sequence. And now we needn't depend on the rounds. We could just say that we always have next. So we could say this returns true. That would make that unused, but have the same result. So this is our logic for an infinite sequence. We could, I guess, say that what we want here is sequence of int. Make that int. Make that int. Make this return int. And then down here map it to fizzbuzz, taking out that. How is that? Rather pleasing. But I think this is the version we should stick with. Interesting, by the way, to just look in generate sequence, which returns a generator sequence. And oh my goodness, does this have a lot of state in it and a lot of complication in order to allow it to work in the general case. But that's all hidden from us behind this lovely call here. This categorization of pure functions as calculations and impure functions as actions is, I think, the work of Eric Normand. He has a very good podcast that I'll reference in the show notes and a book called Grocking Simplicity, which goes into much more detail, albeit in JavaScript. I also wrote a book with Nat Price called Java to Kotlin Refactoring Guidebook, and I'll post a link to the free chapter introduction of Actions to Calculations in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.